All right, guys. Good evening. Um, welcome again to another session. I hope we have a great day and geared up to kick off from where we left off. I know we had a lot to cover from um, from the last class, and before we go, I just like to take your feedback on how how um, efficient um, we um, the knowledge from the last class how efficient and how practical you think it was to you um if you learned anything new you have anything that's some sort of a question so um, i think i'm open to that at this point so let's just quickly do that for like five to ten minutes and then we can kick off officially and try to manage our time as we go so my highs uh good evening i did too good evening angela so what will you advise to for your startup what will you advise but that person you mentioned the startup i'm thinking your company maybe um a small where, tech company. I'm, <laughs> where i'm trying to transition from where i am currently because um not all companies in nigeria do value what you can get from data so for me i felt um basically some companies were just using a uh, excel um probably um access and the likes for, for someone like me i know i need to transition to become a tech guy where I need to be able to use the um, tools like SQL, uh, Python, Power BI, and the likes. So currently, I'm learning a lot of things simultaneously. But I know at the point in time, for me to advance in my own career, why move to where matters are being appreciated? Top guy like me, what would you advise? Um, well, super cool to know that you are trying to um, post. Uh, it's super cool to also know that you're you're, um, you're making the effort amazing. So what I would advise is conceptualization first. Spend time in conceptualization before you jump into the notebook to practice it. Understand the theory behind how it works. Understand understand the theory behind how it works. It's, it's especially important that you understand the concept of how everything fits to themselves, all right? For example, you want to have a data set and you've worked independently with the variables, and then you need to understand how each of them relates to the target variable. You could do that with a group by. Rest with the syntax is not really a product of so much notebook experience. It's a product of understanding the concept and the problem you are trying to solve. And to be honest, it doesn't come in a single, it doesn't come in a minute, it doesn't come in a day. It comes from regular practice. Conceptualize, learn the concept, study the concept, practice it. Learn the concept, study the concept, practice it. And as you as you flow like that, you eventually gain mastery over time. And of course. Um, one good area I would always um, point you towards to get started is to register here at games. Um, it's one key thing that we drive. Conceptualization of the concepts and then practice this practice. Because to be honest, when you walk into an interview, they would really want to test your understanding of the concept before they hand you code to start writing. You really want to fit yourself in that bucket properly where you you are grounded in the concept so you can even talk about it i also like to um i always like to put forward for myself is if you really can do it then you should be able to teach it if you really can do it you should be able to teach it it should not be a problem someone will tell you oh i can't teach it but i can do it well if you can a plus b and make it a b then of course you can teach anybody and say this is a this is b that's how we arrive at a b so you can't say i can do it and i can't teach it that doesn't make a logical uh, that doesn't give uh, a connotation of clear logic mm -hmm. all right if you can actually do it then you should be able to teach it and and that's why i would that's the part where i will push you or i'll point you towards um conceptualization and of course to actually get started is an encouragement to sign up question
Yeah, you answered it quite all right. All right. right. Super. Okay, thank you. Let me allow us to ask your question. Thank okay, you. so please ask your question or I will call you out to ask your question. I'm not the lecturer that will say, if you like, attend class. If you like, don't attend class. If you come to my class, if you are the class, then you must answer. So the least you can do is not attend, but please attend. Already here, I mean, there, why why not participate? And if you say you are shy, I will, I will help you remove the from you from your shy, so you are high. All right. So I think to do you have a question? Did you attend yesterday's class or today is your first class? Ah, welcome. I'm trying to decipher if you're a male or a female, but your voice is really low. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you clearly now. All right. I missed yesterday's class. Today is my first class. Ah. I don't have any question yet. Um, so I'll go check up the class I missed yesterday on YouTube. I got that mail. So, thank you. Fantastic. A question? Ah. Look at my screen. Hello? Yes. We, um, can, hear you. Can, hear you. can we have it on Twitter? Can we have the video yeah. on Twitter? Because I think I follow you on Twitter and um, can, can you on Twitter? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. yeah, yeah. I will send you a message. Yeah. I, I am so sorry. I, I have had like, a very busy week. I know it's been busy, so I understand. I, I will I would I will definitely um, check it out. I am so sorry for that. No problem. Have you here? Get the so yes, we will send the materials to you, right? Even for today's session, you'll be getting um, you'll be getting the materials. So don't worry if you missed the session yesterday, and um, even those who were around yesterday and are not getting are not here today, will also be getting a link to the recording. So don't worry about it. Oh, so somebody can go ahead. So if you have your questions, while we wait for Mr. Samuel to get um, to get done with whatever it is, um, I'll just give us some walkthrough on this um, page. So this is the career growth incubator, all right? So what what do we mean by career growth incubator? Um, first of all, we are Games Consorts. So Games is an acronym. Um, it stands for the Global Academy of Mathematical and Economic Sciences, all right? And that's what games is. It's just an acronym. Now, the, the Choreography Incubator is a special program, right? Um, special in the sense that it gives you a deep dive into tech, but at extremely lower cost. All right. So, if we have to do the programs individually and consider all the factors and the costs into the various programs, right? Typically, uh, uh, tech tech training programs can go up between two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand depending on the complexity and length. And with what you're offering, um, those are actually high-end programs. But we know that that might be a, a discouragement to a lot of people. So we created a career growth incubator, which is a special cohort-based um, cohort based incubator program to kind of bring you up to speed within four months. Um, one, of, one or two of the programs are five months, but the vast majority are four months. So we have six major tracks in this program. That cover much of the top tech careers. All right. So we have the CGI data scientists. So CGI stands for Career Growth Incubator. All right. So we have the CGI data scientist track. We have the CGI AI associate track. And then we have the CGI business analyst track. So it's your goal to pivot into data science and to learn how to code, how to use a combination of coding, um, um, statistical analysis, and um, algorithms. To, to create business value or to, to drive value for the business, to help businesses build models and use those, monetize those models and use those models to guide um, business products, 
then go for data scientist. All right. So you want to learn coding, you want to learn statistical analysis, you want to learn um, algorithms, machine learning algorithms, and all that. Go for data scientist. Do you want to learn how to use machine learning to build intelligent products, intelligent systems, right? You want to build intelligent agents, intelligent systems, machine learning applications, then go for the CDI AI associate track. All right. Do you want to learn how to use data to drive business decisions and business intelligence? Then go for the business analyst track. So here you'll be getting experience with um, SQL and data visualization using of course, you also, you also learn Python here and know how to code, but the focus will be more on the business side of things. Um, the focus will be more on, uh, on tackling business issues using data. All right. So whatever it is, this three, any of these three, this here, this here, and this here, the three of them are going to be very useful. Um, they hinge on data, you know, on the operation of data. All right. But only that they have, um, you have, you know, there are areas of strengths and the areas that they are more similar to their core, right? So if you can go into any of these, depending on your interest, within four months, you would be able to have a strong foundation. We are not the type of people that will push and say you can learn data science in one month or learn analytics in one month, right? Because it, 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 you, you truly can't, you can learn it in one month, but you can't master it in one month, all right? And then the four months is to walk you on your way to mastery we still expect that after the four months, you would have inculcated a habit of continuous learning and continuous development so that after leaving the program, you continue to pursue the knowledge, you continue to build experience, you continue to practice on projects, and as you're doing that, you're well on your way to mastery. And so it's it's a continuous process. It's not something that can finish in one day, but the purpose of, you know, the four-month boot camp, the intensive four-month program, is to get you to the point where you're confident in your skills. So we also have um, the content track, content engineer track. For those who want to do software, I want to focus on the front end. We have the back end track for those who want to focus on the back end. Right? Then we have the advanced advanced data scientist. For those who already have data science background, but you want to now delve further. Maybe you already have done some introductory stuff, you've done machine learning, you've done coding, um, you've built some uh, models in notebook. Now, how do you get out value from those models? All right, how do you translate code to money? You know, how do you operationalize? How do you build data products and machine learning products that really um, are not going to slip in your notebooks or waste in production? They, when you operationalize them, they will really have impact on the business. So these are the things we cover. So whichever of these ones you're interested in, just um, come to our website, Career Growth Incubator. I'm going to put the link up so that you guys can see it. And then I'll be taking questions, all right, based on um, your interests. So once Mr. Summer comes now, we will then um, continue the session. So I'll just put this up on the on the charts. We also give information about these tracks um, via email. So if you have any inquiries as well, you can you can just send us um, a message via email. So I will just quickly scout through everyone in the group. I mean, in the um, in the meeting. Mm, I didn't see you here yesterday. Good evening. Were you in the class yesterday? No, I was not. Oh, okay, okay. So, which um which of the areas are you interested in? Business analytics. Oh, okay, great. That's that's awesome. So, um, we have this um this one that would that would get you um that would help you build a very strong foundation in that area and launch you into the field so i'll probably have to give um i would have to maybe open them and give more details about them depending on how many of us are interested in a certain one so let me move on to hamzat okay yeah i remember hamzat was here yesterday um so mr hamzat can you hear me I can hear you. Okay, so which of the areas? Hello. Uh, yes, I can hear you now. This definitely. This definitely. Oh, great. Okay, great. Um, how about um, Ken? They are uh, uh, they go. No need to call that. No need to call that name. I'll just stick with Ken. So can Ken? They hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Good evening. 
So, what are the areas uh, are you interested in? Okay, it seems many of us are interested in the business analysis graph. That's interesting. Yes, I can hear you. All right, that's interesting. So, um, we also have Nifemi Dorojayu. Yeah, the statistical packages and business analytics. Uh, you have mentioned two things, so statistical packages and business analytics. Yeah. So, anyway, in the business analytics track, you will be doing, um, actually be doing a lot of statistics too, because you have to really understand statistics to work with data. So, typically, people come into our tracks and they have zero coding background or zero statistics background. Maybe because in statistics they are left behind from secondary school, and so they are forgotten most of most of those things. But zero coding background, zero um, data background, and then in our tracks, within uh, once we begin some of these uh, topics, they begin to pick up those skills. And sometimes it's amazing even for us, despite being um, despite having done this training thing for years and you know help people get into the field. We still get amazed how, how it can be, right, for them to pick up the skills. So the important thing is in picking up the skills, you know, but then we we also know that they don't get, they don't become masters immediately and we don't push that narrative, all right? So we just want you to understand, understand, understand. And then when you're coding or implementing, just like Mr. Summer mentioned earlier, all right, the, um, uh, initially the excitement, everyone has their excitement to want to, put up something in a notebook, write a piece of code and get something functional, all right? But when it now comes to justifying how you arrived at, you know, your solution, uh, knowing what works and why it works, and then if any implementation, I mean, if any changes need to be made or any adjustments need to be made, understanding how to fine tune the whole process, the whole implementation of your code, right? That understanding comes from strong conceptual underpinnings. So we balance that uh, um, theory with practice. And so um, by the time you start implementing code, you realize that the first step to any data process or any analytics process, right, when you're writing code is the logic behind the code. You must understand how the logic works. And so your code is only an implementation of the logic. And in a business scenario, your logic is a business logic, all right? The business logic follows the business requirement. And so you must be able to frame the business logic properly Structure properly uh, for you to be able to translate it to technical language and technical terms, and then write a piece of code or write an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, or um, or do a visualization in line with that business logic. So whatever it, whatever track you want to now find yourself in, you see that um, you you know you are getting grounded in as much of the um, conceptual knowledge as you need but also working with these tools and technologies. So all these, they blend together, they work together for you to be able to achieve the actual end of every project, which is to make maximum impacts with data. So since many of us chose um, business analysis, I'll just open this one now. I'm just going to open this. So we have um, so for the business analyst track, all right. Um, it's a four-month boot camp, starting February, and um, we we teach you the blend of skills that you need to be able to work with real world data. You know, real world data is um, it's not as simple as just your, your data set in Excel that is always tabular. In the real world, you work on more complex data sets, having more rules and more features. You know, imagine working with data of hundreds of thousands of rules and you need to analyze the data and get insight out of it, right? So what's the first step? How do you, uh, um, how do you understand the data? And your data understanding, what are the statistical implications? You know, how do you use statistics to first of all analyze the distribution of your data? Because the thing is, before you jump into the analysis, we always tell people, right, you have to make 
you write assumptions about the data. People will see a piece of data and say, okay, I'm thinking it is skewed. I'm thinking it is this. I'm thinking it is that. How do you, what, what are you thinking? What are you guessing when you can check the statistics? So we teach you the fact that you need to be able to explore data and understand data. And as much of it as you need to now guide the rest of the project. You will learn how to work with SQL to manipulate the data in databases, right? You'll be able to send information to the database to retrieve answers, right? So we call this process querying. You're querying the data, which means you are probing the data in the database by sending signals, communication signals to the database and retrieving the insight from the database. So you learn how to um, use SQL to translate questions to code and get the answers for those business questions. And then uh, um, data robots for automated uh, machine learning Python for programming. Because even as a business analyst, um, you still you, you could find yourself in a position that requires you to write code. Right, so you, you you should be comfortable writing code because you're working in data. You know, so in as much as people would like to put the narrative that you don't need to be a code to be in technology, it's true. You don't need to learn how to code, uh, but it also depends on which area you're finding yourself in, right? So the, no one has ever gotten this advantage learning Python, right? The reason people always tell you you don't you don't have to know how to code is because many people are scared of coding. So in order not to discourage anyone, we tell you you don't need to learn how to code. But the moment you can learn from people who really can teach you well enough that you become confident in that skill, the moment you can pick up that skill, it's a much right. And again, um, we have not we have not really had any student that had any challenge after going through a Python, you know, lessons that had any challenge picking it up. You know, so the challenges now come as uh, um, later challenges, challenges of um, challenges of you know, higher implementations. Now, when we give you open-ended problems, you have to solve. You have to you have to think out the problem. You have to you have to understand the logic, and then you have to write code and implement that logic. Uh, but whatever it is, we will be using Python for coding. Then Power BI for visualization of your data. We'll be learning that as well, and also projects accompany um, each of these uh, each of these topics. Right? For example, in our previous course, there was the SQL project, there was the Start project, there was the Python project. And so on and so forth. All right. Um, so this starts um, February 12th. Uh, although the onboarding is starting this weekend, so why would you miss the onboarding? Because that's why we give you all the information mm -hmm. that you need, and then you will get settled in the cohort. The purpose of um, separating the onboarding time with the training time is so that there's enough time for you to get materials, ask questions, get settled into the community, and then you. Uh, um, once the training begins, you are no longer having to, you no longer have to rush you know, to try to maybe uh, um, know what's going on and how, how you are going to use the various platforms that we use. You'd already have, um, you'd have been given a walkthrough across the platform and how to navigate the platform, how to submit assignments, how to do you know, one thing or the other. So for those of you that are going to be starting, make up your mind to um, enroll as soon as possible. So that they can settle in with the rest of the course. Then, and um, now this splits this into four modules, right? So the track is not four modules, sorry, four courses. And so in each of the courses, we have four modules. So we call each of our courses, we call them parts, right? So typically, um, we are going to be having some online courses soon, shorter online courses than our tracks that you can take within two weeks to one month, right? So if this kind of um, courses now that would be uh, be um, that would be stand alone, you know, for people who want to just take a specific portion. But for our tracks, um, for the BA track, the business analyst track, we have these form four courses from part one to part four. And so in each of the the courses, we have the um, we have the modules. So from introduction, where we we'll get you grounded in what data is and what analytics is. You would also understand. You would also understand the data value chain, right? Uh, many people don't really. Many people going into business analytics and data science, they get to learn this later on the job, right? Because business operations will force you to pick up business knowledge, right? So they get to start learning data strategy. Many of them don't have an idea when they're starting up, but we're giving that opportunity for you to learn it from the go, so that you already you, you are you are you are coming with. You are you are entering the field with the right alignment, all right? So it's not just you know 
code, 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 or visualization, visualization, or technical, technical, technical. How about learning something from the business side, right? So data strategy design, business thinking, success factors, and some of those um, areas that you'll be getting grounded in. Then um, part two is working with data, where we not take you from Python to SQL mm -hmm. to, you know, to some of the um, data operations. Then part three is uncovering business insights, where you learn statistical analysis. Um, you will go further in exploratory data analysis, and then um, a bit of machine learning. The interesting thing is that for machine learning, business analysts don't need to know so much of machine learning per se, but they need to understand it enough to at least um, be able to contribute to machine learning projects, which is why we introduce it. So that it's not when you get to the job that you have to start struggling to pick it up, right? You can learn it from the go, all right? Then communicating business insights are part four, um, which now takes you, um, gives you a deep, deep dive into Power BI. And then you begin to learn things like how to communicate decision insights, how to pitch your projects to managers and decision makers. You know, many people don't know this, but in tech, um, there are some uh, the things that happen at the strategy level, at the at the executive level or the business side of things, right, are very much different from how technical operations happen. And most times, technical teams are out of alignment with business uh, expectations. The reason is because technical teams don't really understand business expectations. That's typically they don't understand. It doesn't mean it's, it's like that in all cases, but typically they don't get to understand. All right. Then the business side um, sometimes don't understand the complexities of technical processes. Right. So it's always an advantage when you have learned how to deal with business people or the executive, how to get back in on your project. Right. So let's say you have seen a value in a particular project, but the business people are thinking of something else, you know, they want you to be able to quantify your project or the proposal you have in terms of business value. How much performance uh, improvement does it add to us? How much, um, how much um, additional ROI does it add? Does it, does it help us? Um, does it help us evade a certain amount of risk? How much loss are we going to be evading by embarking on this project? Quantify, right? So when you have this understanding and know how the business people think, you'll be able to pitch properly to managers and decision makers, you're able to get buy-in in such meetings, you know, that would allow them to, you know, approve the things you're doing. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of brush between technical teams and the business teams. Then understanding stakeholder management too, that's also interesting. And so these, some of these topics, right, um, we have the core faculty at games that teaches some of these topics, actually most of them, especially the practical and technical side. But for some other intricate areas, we bring in um, a global um, audience. We, I mean, we bring in a global, what's it called? Um, we bring, bring in global experts, right, in the field, you know, from various international organizations that come to handle some specific topics and give us deep, profound insights into these things. Because, you know, um, in as much as we want to be able to exhaust some of these things, we also recognize the value of people who have built several years of experience, especially on the business side of things. So they come to enrich the insights that we are sharing to, to you, you know, to the students. They come to, to enrich your perspective, all right? They come to, um, to help you see things at the global level, right? So that you are not just used to the Nigerian system or streamlined to this system. You should be able to come out of this track and start applying for remote jobs internationally. Right, that's actually what we even intend. We want you to get out of this job and, you know, you, you start interacting with some of these um, global leaders. You start, you know, um, having, having chats with them from uh, meetings and, you know, you, you see how much opportunity exists out there. And before you know, it, you get comfortable and confident to apply for international jobs. You know, typically the, the only thing that makes people, um, that restricts people or prevents people from applying for these roles is just that initial, um, uh, what's it called? initial, uh, should I say fear or or drop back about whether or not they will succeed. But the moment you give it your first trial, your second trial, your third trial, and it picks up, you know, it, it's hard for you to come back to just the Nigerian space unless you have a very catchy offer um, for you here. All right. So we are really taking things to a global level. We want everyone to think globally and also um, have the required competence to function properly in these roles. So that's it for the modules. Um, four months of immersive learning, you build a portfolio of projects, all right? 
And the thing about games, let me just quickly mention this because um, you need to know, we don't rush things at games, right? We don't rush things at games. So we would, we would, we would take our time to make sure that um, everyone is really catching the topics. We don't skip topics, all right? And even if we speak, skip a topic, especially if it's a very important topic, be sure we'll revisit it, you know? So we, we make sure that everyone is really getting as much value as they can from the program because we don't want to leave the program with gaps. We can't teach everything. If we want to teach everything, typically we can do one year. But then once we are teaching are rich enough, you know, we have picked the ones that are rich enough and want you to be grounded in them so that when you have them, you have a very strong best eye view of the field, you know, and you're not having gaps. One of the problems with data scientists or business analysts when they break into the field is a lot of gaps, right? And that's because those gaps arise most, most times due to maybe rushing um, the learning process, or skipping important areas, or some even look at some areas as, as though they are simplistic, just too simple, and so they skip those areas. And that, you know, more or less prevents them from exploring and going as deep as they can, right? So we want you to grow a desire for deep and profound understanding through thorough engagement with these topics, all right? And so we make sure that we, we don't rush the process, you know, sometimes we even have to revisit some of the topics. So you get certified, and um, since it is a track, it's like a combination of courses. So you're not only getting a single certification for the program, you are getting um, a certificate for the major topics that were covered in the track, the major topics, um, EDA, Uncovering Business Insights, Power BI, Communicating Business Insights, then Analytics and Automated Machine Learning on Data Robot. You are getting these and, you know, um, when you present these things, these kinds of certificates, you know, you're not only presenting them, you're also presenting, you know, projects that demonstrate that you really know what you're doing, that you really end the certification. Because um, the main thing we want to help people to understand is that your cert a certification should not be your ultimate drive. Your drive should be mastery. Your drive should be understanding. Your drive should be competence in that area, right? And so when we are handing you the certificates, we hand you the certificates on the basis of your accomplishments in the field, in the um, in the learning outcomes. If you have not done anything, you will not get anything. But of course, we expect that if you come to the track, you're coming with a, a high level of seriousness, and so you will not uh, um, you will not waste the opportunity. Okay, um, so uh, that's just pretty much um, that. Then, um, oh, some 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 persons are just joining us. They have missed a good dose of. And the information I've shared so far. Anyways, you can always catch up. So um, our program is um, a a um, sixty thousand naira fee only. You know. So remember what I said earlier that what we are trying to do is to lower the barrier to entry so that cost is not a factor. So make the program as as low as possible, right? For a four month track as comprehensive as all the things I've mentioned earlier, you know, you realize that it's so much value that you're getting out of this. Okay, so anyone who has um, come across other academies and other programs that are offered, you know, you do the comparison, right? You see that it's so much value and you are probably getting far more than, you know, what you'd get out there, all right? So we uh, um, we expect you, one of the reasons why one of these technical sessions is for you to now get um, insight into how our classes go, right? Even if you don't have a background in Python, right? They, 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 your in, as as you attend these sessions, you know you'll be able to see how the lectures are delivered, and then you realize that you know there's so much you can get when you you join the games community, and so we also recognize that this may also be a drawback for for you know for people as well. You know, not everybody might be able to to put this down immediately. So to further um, to further uh, make the whole process more flexible for everyone, right? We have created an installment payments option. And then for those who are students and core members, there's a scholarship plan as well. So you can pay in three installments, right? Remember the link I've sent on the um, on the on the chats. You can always go to that link and um, find those programs. So we have this installment plan, you register and then you are in. Then for core members, as much as 75% um, tuition waiver, which means um, from 60,000 
you would only have to register with 15,000 as low as that. So if you know core members or um, students, university students based in Nigeria, this is an opportunity for them, right? And so once you enroll, we are good to go. Onboarding starts February 5. All right, remember what I said, onboarding starts February 5. And then lectures kick off from February 12. All right, but we want you to settle in before the lectures. Don't come to the lecture, um, don't, don't come on February 12 and start asking us, how do you navigate the platform? How do you how do you find the lectures in the classroom environment? How do you do this? How do you do that? We teach you all those details. We teach you all those details from the onboarding session. All right. So everything I've said so far is for the business analyst track because that's what you guys identified. But uh, new persons have entered now and probably we have new interests. So very quickly, I'll be taking questions. Is Mr. Summer back so that you just continue the session? Shortly after I'm done. I mean, immediately after I'm done. Uh, yes, I am, but you can go ahead and take uh, the yes, questions. But you can go ahead and take the questions. Okay, great. So very quickly, let me take questions. Um, you have your questions about the program or some of information. So far, just um, you can unmute your mic now and just start asking your questions. Any questions? Any questions? So just to recap, for those who have just joined, um, I'll go back to all the tracks. So earlier I identified some of, um, I mean, the key tracks that we have in a career growth incubator program, right? So it's a four month boot camp, a four month intensive program that blends um, um, thorough understanding of the field with technical practice, all right? And um, we have the data scientist track, we have the AI associate track, the business analyst track, we have the front end track, the back end track, and the advanced data scientist track. So depending on your areas of interest, um, you can send in your questions. But um, since I've not gotten questions so far, I will not want to drag this further. Okay, so I'll return back to, um, we'll just get back to our um, technical session. So, Mr. Samuel, over to you now. If questions arise or you think you think of anything, you can put them in the chats. I'll be checking them, and I'll be giving a response to your questions. I will do as much as I can to try to sort out the question. Before I left off, I was trying to ask um, for those who were in the last class from yesterday, uh, do you have any feedback question um, that you that we left off and that we couldn't attend to, or you want to spotlight something? Put to that for the next two minutes. I already gave about five minutes for that earlier, so I'll just give an extra two minutes. If you have a question. And then I'll just start with the basic recap of what we did yesterday, and then we can shoot on from home. And yet again, I should mention that when I lead a class, I share my questions around. What that simply means is if you do not have a question, I will spotlight you and I will ask you a question. Spotlight. In, in, in an awkward way. I'll just bring it to the center so that you are glaring for everybody to see. Uh, and then I'll, I'm going to throw you something to, to answer. Keep an engagement, and I'm not a typical lecturer in the front of the classroom and just talk and go. All right. So um, if there are any other questions, we take that as we go, or else uh, we we'll just carry on. Um, um, Yesterday, we talked about data cleaning and manipulation, and we looked at part one, but the focus more for yesterday was on understanding the data set and dealing with inconsistencies within the data set and dealing with, with the data set and um, understanding the, the data set definition uh, to the data. Because it's much more important to bring logic to the data. You don't take a data set around to your, your notebook. 
down with data set as a data scientist, understand what your data set is, is about and what it is communicating, and then you can then bring life into that data set from your visualization and all and all and all, which make um, it begins to make more sense. Then we looked at different techniques um, for um, our manipulation and, and cleaning. We looked at definition of term. We worked with some very basic uh, library, NumPy for scientific computing, Pandas for manipulation, Seaborn, Matplotlib for visualization. And then, um, of course, we... Okay, so I need to point this out again. Uh, where you see the clear warning, I put it there. You do not have to put it because if you put it, yeah, there's a high chance, a high percentage that we run into errors and you will never see the errors. All right, but I put it there because, of course, this is what I've used uh, and I can easily understand what errors are and I can just simply avoid them. My work with mess. But of course, you should be as much as, uh, as much as possible avoid the um, importing warnings as much as possible. All right, then we imported our data sets. Uh, we looked at just 20 euros from our data sets. So what is our data set? Our data set is a very old um, data set, an electricity data set that was collected in New South Wales in Australia. The prediction or the essence of collecting data set was trying to predict the fluctuation in price of electricity in New South Wales. All right, so the, the data story is um, New South Wales has electricity but not sufficient, so they are uh, piping some electricity from neighboring state, which is Victoria, and they need to predict of uh, the electricity charge. All right, they need to predict the state of electricity charge if it is going to be a spike up or it's going to be coming down based on how consumers will relate with it. All right, so then they collected data of the days in, of a particular duration, which was over two years, from 7th of May to 5th of December, and then for seven days, and uh, periodically, they collected data points, periodically for half an hour, 48 points for every half an hour, all right? And then um, New, New South Wales price was also collected, and the demand for electricity in New South Wales was also collected. Then they also performed the same thing for Victoria, uh, Victoria City, they collected the price of the electricity and they collected the demand for the cost going to be important variables to determine if the price was going to spike or drop. And then they collected the state of the transfer and the schedule of transfer across both states. All right, so that's basically our data understanding for our data set in terms of the variables so that we understand clearly what is the data set, what the data set is demanding from us, and what we can do regarding the data set. So it's a data set of about 45,312 rows. And all right. Um, so uh, what are we doing? Uh, definition of term. We have data cleaning and data manipulation. The Terminology. So basically, when we talk about data cleaning, we're talking about the act of detecting and addressing, detecting and addressing consistency in our data set or our data source. We talk about data manipulation, we're talking about organizing data to make it readable, um, organized and structured, um, different technique. Okay. All right, um, um, where did that stop? Okay, so importance of data manipulation and data cleaning, of course, keeps consistency. So what I'm doing just now, um, in case you're just joining, I'm just taking out a walk through, brief walkthrough of what we achieved yesterday so that we can quickly kick start. We can quickly kick start at the, at the piece. All right, so how is our work we're going to run? As our workflow going to run, we will be running um, from inspecting, from importing our library to inspecting, 
and then we'll move over to cleaning and then we'll touch the manipulation. Um, then we'll look at library imports about this um, already. So based on our workflow, we're looking at inspecting the data set. So just to iterate, you cannot move from importing your data without inspecting your data. As a matter of fact, you need to spend time inspecting You need to spend time inspecting your data, all right? You need to spend time in your data. Ah, why is this important? It's critically important because, um, it's critically important because it helps you understand what is required of your data and uh, also figure out what is expected of your data and what your data contains statistically. All right, so we looked at um, our data type, our data info, quite important. Uh, I won't be able to touch so much on the data inspection, allow you to fall back on the recording from yesterday. And, and then we looked at the statistical summary, um, quite important. Um, the count represents the number of, number of items on each column. The mean, the mean, the, the uh, arithmetic mean on the column, uh, standard deviation, then we have the minimum number value in that column, the 25th percentile, 58th percentile, 75th percentile, and then we have the maximum, which is the highest number. So what we did next for checking our data values was to check for duplicates, quite important. Especially if you're working with a distinct data set, we need to ensure that we have duplicates within our data set. All right. Um, Um, to check if we had unique values on our data set. Okay, um, then what we did next was then to check for a number of unique values on our data set. And next we checked for um, missing values, all right? So this is where we start checking for missing values. And uh, as it turns out, um, when you check for missing values in just this null, it gives you a Boolean um, data set. But then um, that doesn't be looking for. So we needed to, through the, or even if it's just one, give us a, a Boolean um, response on that. Okay, and then the next thing we did here was to check the total sum of missing values per column. And then we looked at this, the distribution. We looked at the correlation um, of the data set as against its own self, all right? Each of these five cleaning techniques, special use cases, but nonetheless, the goal was not to use only one. The goal was to data set and see how each of these techniques play critical role and how in other data sets and also real world problems can come into uh, good use and time solution. All right, so what we did um, was first to move our target variables, variables into uh, the uh, data underscore fit. All right, so this specifies only the identified columns in here. All right, and then we only we did not include the target column, which is class because it is a target column and we, we are keeping our cleaning and feature engineering and whatsoever to just the features. In short, you do not want to tamper with the class because the class is actually there for, and you do not want to tamper with it and alter the values. And so we moved that into another variable and called it underscore fit. We, we looked at that data underscore feed by calling the dot head method, and we can see that, of course, it's cool. Then we began with the first step. So the first step involves removing all those with null values. Is anybody trying to ask a question?
So guys, you know, okay, I don't think so. Right. So um, we did that by all rules with no values. Okay. So what we did was to ensure we maintain the integrity of our data set with just <laughs> somebody is asking who this class has been recorded. I don't know what to answer. I just hope, I hope to. All right, so what we did was to remove all rows with missing values. All right, so to ensure we maintain the integrity of our data set with just features, we moved once more the, variable, the, the data frame into another variable name called the it's NA drop. All right, so NA is an acronym for the missing values. So we do that and say those with all NA dropped, that's with all missing values dropped. And then we use the drop any, the drop any method from pandas to drop all missing values. Now I did explain that if we say axis is equal to one column, if we say axis is equal to zero, we are specifying rows, all right? Axis is equal to zero is always, Okay, so it's always default as axis is equal to zero. So you really want to check that out. And then after doing that, we realized that we had 445,312 rows, uh, some rows and ended up with 45,135. After it, we realized we dropped 177 records. And again, do not, except you absolutely know what you're doing do not drop missing rows except you absolutely know what you're doing you drop missing rows you drop critically important uh data points from your sample automatically it uses bias so you, you want to be careful what you're doing do not drop rows drop rows and then um, we, when we tried out another uh, another technique, dropping to be drop all columns. Okay, so we drop all columns with no values. And like I mentioned, when we specify axis is equal to one, we are saying drop columns. Because again, to maintain integrity of our data underscore fit, I moved data frame into another another variable name called columns with any drops dropped the column okay and then i passed it back into itself and when we did our evaluation on that we realized that we had nine columns all right uh we dropped it we had nine columns uh the number of rows that remained after dropping was eight which means one column was dropped one column all right, now the next technique we looked at was replacing values with zero. Um, you can actually replace with anything. You can replace with the term called missing. You can replace with whatever term or name you, you feel you like, all right? So why I'm feeling with zero is because, of course, you can see we're working with a numerical data set. All right, we are working with a numerical data set. If it was, if the problem was a text-based problem, of course, I would not be, be, be filling missing values with zero. Instead, I'd be filling missing values with an appropriate term, um, space, or fill with just another technique, all right? Not zeros, except I now move further to vectorization. That uh, normally, uh, because of, my, my data set is a numerical data set. Of course, it makes more sense to fill with zero. You can actually fill with one, you can fill with two, you can fill with whatever value you want. All right, it's up to you. But of course, you know if these are missing values and you want to make them be as null as possible, you have to fill with zero. But like I mentioned again, it's up to your data understanding. You need to understand the data set you're working with. You can't just pick a data set and start filling with missing, missing values. You need to understand. Should I be filling with zero as a missing value or should I be filling with 1.0, all right? If this data set has been normalized between zero and one, then I know that I can fill with either one or I can fill with either zero, all right? Or I can fill with any value that appears. But yet again, 
you, you now have to ask yourself, if I fill this data with one, will that not introduce bias? Would that not mean that a greater number of percentage are now filled with one, another, uh, uh, another section filled with zero? Do you understand? So let's say, for example, you, you, you work in, um, uh, what time should I use now? Um, you work in, in an apple factory. Fantastic, an apple factory. All right, and then you realize that if you are shipping, you ship green apples to South Africa, you ship red apples to Nigeria or Uganda or whatever country. All right, and then you realize that the number of ships to Nigeria, red apples, are lesser because of production. Okay, but then you have more green apples. And of the year, of course, the data scientists will pick up the data set and then try to draw up visualizations, analytics, and all that to be able to present to the business team so they can draw insights and then make decisions for the next year. Production manager, you have picked up some green apples, ship that, ship them into the red apples, and then move to Nigeria. All right. Now the idea is that they were supposed to understand that year that they they were actually drought or drought in harvest of red apples and then they can shift uh, investigation into the farms but thank god for you uh, and your super uh, i want to be able to solve all the problems in the world you have helped them feed that missing value with red that and then surprisingly there are no missing values but guess what you have introduced bias into the production line for that year so if that same drought in harvest that occurred the year occurred the next year, the business will never be aware and will be thrown into shambles. So what I'm trying to buttress is as a data scientist, you cannot make uncalculated mistake. Mistake, you can set to calculate and say, okay, um, let me first, for example, sometimes you can deliberately introduce bias into your data set to see how it will perform. All right, you can start to deliberately introduce outliers, deliberately introduce noise. Okay, if you work with um, audio data sets, you realize that you need noise to be able to allow the model to differentiate appropriately. All right, so sometimes you may need to deliberately introduce dirt into your data for randomness. Okay, but yet again, you don't want to make uncalculated mistakes as a data scientist because that would be crazily dangerous for you as 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 a key person on any team that you belong to. Okay, I'll pause here and then I, I would um, take questions. Does anybody have a question? Does anybody have a question? Yeah, before I move on. Does anybody have a question? All right, so then we looked at, after feeling with, um, values we we moved on and um, visualized what we've done so far and then we realized that after filling with missing values filling all the zeros with missing values um had some missing values all right we still had some missing values right here please pardon me what, what we did here was not check for missing values what guys our data set again all right the original data set Okay, I, I kept moving the data frame into new variable names to maintain it. the original data set. That's why you can see, see that there are still some missing values saying none, none, none here. All right, so Python says um, pandas calls places with missing values none, which is not a number, all right, because of course it's a numerical, um, trans numerical data, although it can, of course, process. Okay, so what we did next then was to move into another uh, filling technique, which was to fill with um, okay, through interpolation, All right? So we decided to perform interpolation technique with fill with nearest. Now, Pandas gives us, um, gives us two major interpolation technique. One is backward fill and the other is forward fill. Backward fill and the other is forward fill. Um, all right, um, apologies, please. Um, going on, uh, 
So we looked at two major interpolation techniques. Please confirm that you can hear me, please. If you can hear me, I need everyone. To... Can I hear you? All right, cool. I just needed to know that we are not only just two in the class. Okay, so um, two major, two major field um, F field, F field. Now let me try and explain what this is. Now, if you look at the data set, you find that we have a missing value so value. Here. Same way applies for the other ones. Now, when we apply interpolation technique, all right, interpolation just simply means filling that value, all right, bring where else into another position values. But in the position of a value, instead, you're, the, you're, you're filling a missing value or an empty space with a new value that you may have gotten from, from a computed value. All right, so interpolate, you are, in, you are populating, all right, you are populating internally. All right, so um, technique you can employ from pandas, B fill or F fill, which, which involves backward fill and forward fill. Forward fill, we mean we are taking the value from here, that to replace our none, right here. Forward fill, we are taking the value from here, and we are using it to replace the value right here. Now you can do this row wise or column wise. All right, so when we say we do it row wise, we're picking value from here and we are filling it right here. Or we're taking value from here and we're filling it right here. And yes, of course, um, the, the, a good way to get that done is right zero, we refer to row and add this just one. Um, if, all right, so. so Move on down to so now we've done some very popular technique. All right, we've done cleaning with um, we've done cleaning by dropping missing values, we've done cleaning by filling missing values with another value, we have done missing values with um, using interpolation. All right, uh, I think this and this are actually the same four and five are. So we have done with filling nearest, all right, which is um, interpolation. And then now we are on filling with central tendency. So when we refer to central tendency, we are actually just referring to the three M's. Central measures of tendency, we are referring to the three M's, mean, median, mode. Now, quite tricky. I know you've seen a lot of data science notebooks, you've seen a lot of uh, cleaning methods where they just use fill with mean, fill with median, fill with mode, and everybody just moves on. Well, I need to bust your bubble that you cannot just do that on the data set and walk away. Okay, you cannot just fill with mode and you are fine. Or you cannot just fill with mean and you're good to go. You need to understand why mean is the most appropriate technique at that time mode is the most appropriate technique at that time you cannot just fill it in all right it has to be an assumption it has to be an assumption that you laid out all right so scientist you are as much of a scientist you are just focused on data in short you are a scientist data scientific process Experimentation, hypothesis, uh, testing, it's all. You need to ensure you are carefully following that so you are walking through line by line, step by step, and um, making uh, guesses. Okay, you're not just making wild guesses and then doing that. I mentioned earlier, it can skew your data set, it can introduce bias, it can, it can just create something messy. And then you go ahead and make prediction or you go ahead and visualize and you're giving wrong information. So what we'll look at is overall, I made six assumptions. All right, so what I want us to do in the next 15 minutes is to look at these six assumptions based on the data set. All right, these are six assumptions based on the data set, and then the notebook. Um, I will, I will, at the close of the session, I will revisit that question, all right? Question. Okay, so since I've laid out six assumptions right here on the data sets, and sorry, 
it's quite important. We need to discuss on these assumptions. Now, these assumptions are going to guide us as we feel our missing values with statistical measures of tendency. So we start with number one. You need to be well aware that I'm going to call you out. So, so please put that at the back of your mind and get ready. Let your mic not fail you at this particular time. And let your network not go off at the same time. All right, so we'll, we'll look at this, these um, different, um, all right, um, let's discuss with number one. So number one, we need to fill the missing values in period. All the values you have been filling in all the while, they are just examples. They are not actually implemented on the data sets. They are just technique I want us to learn for that, for the purpose of this class. So do not assume that data set is already clean much dirty because nothing has been done on it so let me just quickly run my notebook top to bottom it's, it's uh, the variables are packed into the kernel number one um what i said what as my assumption was since the periodic variable is a measure of is a time of measurement okay between uh, 1 to 48 which is which are all data points about half an hour interval for 24 hours. So that simply means for every single day, the data, collect, the data collection officer collects data, data every 30 minutes. All right, so average we can say collected about um, um, points for every day, all right? So in, in an half hour interval, it collects 48 points and then again, go again, collect under 48 points. Now, they are missing values in the period column. And safely clean this data by applying value for already established. Well, that's your that's your mission for my question still stands. All right. Do you agree with this as something the period variable, or do you have an alternative that is best suited? So I'll start this question with I'll start this session with um Amza was in yesterday's class, so Amza to be the best to kick off this engagement. Which means that it's not, you know, it's not every day representing. Yeah, just uh, basically just four days. Day. Huh? I said that makes sense because you have four beans. Huh? Four beans in that. Exactly. Uh, four beans yeah. yeah. Exactly, four beans of the Yeah. And so. Each of those selected dates, it, it looks to me as though they found the dates were more within either Monday and Tuesday or the first two days. Or the first two days. And the fourth and fifth day. And then, in fact, more around two, five, six, pretty much. Because you can see that it's still over from the right hand of two to the left hand of two. Same goes for four, I mean, five, goes for six okay yeah it goes for three so we can yeah. see that well i won't be able to make conclusions based on one two three four five and seven but it's obvious that some days occurred more often than some other days exactly in fact you're right about the the way it is there's a way we will the way we would there's, there's a skewed argument we would specify that would properly center those beans on the appropriate number, right? Um, there's a parameter we'll just have to add to the visuals. But in the absence of that, the main thing here is that we just have some selected um, days of the week, right? We have some selected days. So I, I wanted um, Samuel to, Mr. Samuel to revisit that data. I don't know, it seems it's Mike, Cannot um, unmute. So we see that data again, right? I want to know what these numbers on the vertical column mean. The reason I'm doing this walkthrough, right, is to help us reason about the data so that we are not just jumping into conclusions. You know, from an expert's perspective, we can just say, okay, this is the approach to use we fill in with this value all right but for 
for those in the house, for those of you learning now, you might really wonder why exactly are we using this? So we need to see that. And now if you look at the day distribution, um, while I'm waiting for response about uh, what the vertical column numbers are, all right, while we're waiting for that, um, if you look at this distribution, you realize that the beans actually occur, they pretty much have the same values. So if, if the, the, the vertical axis is talking about distribution, all right, if it's talking about distribution, that is how many times in the data do we have the one? It's over 6,000. And um, let me tell you, I'm looking at this, that visual now. As, as I zoomed in now, I realized that one and two actually, um, what's it called? They are overlaying. Oh, I think that's what Samuel meant in the, uh, I saw his message. I saw his message um, about, just texted me. Oh, he texted me on the, on the chats. So the data is overlaying or the visuals. Uh, so we have the beans, right? They are distinct beans, but they, they kind of, you know, they are overlaying. So we really actually have seven beans here, if you look at it. Bin number one and two are joined together. Then we have bin number three. Four and five are joined together. Six and seven are joined together. Tim, I don't know if you are noticing this. And does anyone else notice that? Hello? Yes, I, I think I did. Exactly. Sorry, I, I had to join from my mobile. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm trying to gain control of my PC, but there's, there's a bit of a glitch. <laughs> so, the, yeah, the data is actually seven beans because it was collected by a period of seven days. Exactly. So I'm seeing here because I had to zoom and I realized that yes, one and the two bin for number two is a little higher yes. than the bin for number one. But because they overlap, it's hard to notice. Right, so which means we have seven. You know, normally if, um, you just maybe for this class, Mr. Samuel don't want to make um, the whole thing too elaborate, but in a reward project, we'd have to strengthen the code for this um, visualization by adding parameters, additional parameters that will make each bin to be centered on the appropriate number. So bin number one will be centered on that position one, right? So this, your, num your number you have here for number one, it will be at the center of the first bin. Bin number three is a little manageable, but if you look at it, that number three is not still properly centered. You know, the pin is not centered exactly on number three. Number three is supposed to be at the midpoint of that pin, if we specify additional parameters in the code, right? So now we have seven bins. I think Mr. Hamza wanted to say something, so let me hear what you wanted to say. The hello. Yes, go yeah, ahead. In between, would it be the fact that um, during the day you don't have um, the same level of um, response, the same level of um, information across the day? Like you, you have a drop in within the day. Um, I don't. I'm not really getting that. Okay, the, really the graph that. we are looking at. What we are looking at now, the spaces in between the days. Yeah. I'm saying, could it be that at a point in time during the day, there are drops in the in the figures that we are getting? No, 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 no. Like, Those spaces between okay. yeah. the uh, how do I put this? The spaces between the bins are not due to yeah. data values, right? Okay. The reason we have spaces like that is because the histogram. Is being discretized normally when you when you are creating an oh. histogram we discretize which means we break up numerical values into individual categories okay right oh, okay, okay, okay so depending on how many categories can fill the plot there might be no spacing between the different bins for example if you look at um which plots which plots look at the second 
row, the second um, um yep. yeah, and look at that second plot there, the one in the middle, just right below the day plot. Okay, look at that, all the beans are joined together. So typically this one doesn't give you space because I think there should be about okay. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten beans in the data. So it doesn't allow for space. You see. So that's uh, that's you know pretty much the reason why you have space. It's not necessarily because of maybe any delays within the data. It's just an issue with the visualization, and we can tweak the visuals. That's the beautiful thing about Python. It's the visualizations. So um, I think Mr. Samuel's screen is down. So we can customize the visualizations. You know, to display it in a way that we want especially in order for everyone to just look at it and be able to understand it exactly. uh, so as this was a project for example a very a technical project that we are giving to everyone to solve you know you want to be more deliberate about the display you know but we can't be introducing all that um, i'm sure mr samuel didn't want to introduce all that into the session because that would just be a lot of um, a lot of detail that might not be useful for a beginner class an introductory class so that's pretty much what you have so for each bean now day one you are having the frequency of occurrence of day one i think that was about six thousand or more day two six thousand or more and like that and you see that the numbers really pretty much coincide so what do you say is the mode of this distribution if you look at that data what would you say the mode is While we're, waiting for, while we're waiting for the screen to be back, I want us to just picture what we saw earlier, right? So if you look at, I mean, if you think of that distribution, what would you say is the mode? You realize that there's no single specific number that probably has the highest occurrence. It appears that several numbers have, you know, that's the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they seem to have equal number of occurrences. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. Okay, I don't know if Timita wants to add something or if you are if you made any observation. Um yeah, sometimes the visualization can actually be challenging. And um, exactly one, one, one thing that some people need to understand that the base of data science is domain knowledge. You, I mean, on the, on, I won't say domain knowledge, I'll say understand your data. Domain knowledge is coming much later. Understand the data, what exactly does the data look like? So, for example, now looking at this, um, we might not have been able to spot out that we have, con I mean, continuous distribution, right? Because it looks all this space for the days, right? For, for, you know, the data was collected over seven days, that is setting, and that's done on the table. But then now it looks as though some days were more important than other days. And that is what, looking at that, it should take us back into our data and then look at the data and look at, you know, probably you might use group by function and group by the day. You understand? And then do some counts. I don't know if you get my point. So yes, how many group, some group by the day, okay, group by day, so you have seven groups. And then you do a count of each day. You can actually look into, I mean, you can actually get an estimate of how many data was collected per day. And that would help begin to understand, really, is, there discrete, is this a discrete I mean, visualization or not? Then having that understanding, we can come back and begin to adjust our visualization. Um, um, the best of computer programs still needs human understanding because it's only going to show based on what it has. But then as data scientists, you have to go back into your data back and forth to understand the data in the whole holistic form. And then it helps you when you're making you know, predictions or you're making uh, assumptions. And those assumptions might be very uh, 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 costly when you know, made wrongly. I also noticed that day one and day two had slight changes in the height. Very exactly. slight. And 
and that could be the, 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 the beginning of another you know, insight of, 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 that you might want to pursue. Again, why do we have that variation? Was there days in things? Was there a particular day out of all the contribution, I mean, collisions, I mean, the day that day one was probably me? Maybe because rain fell, maybe because something happened and then one data was, you know, omitted. Or what could cause that variation? And then that could also be the beginning of where you begin to look into day two, day three, day four, day five. And then um, um, probably you might want to use a little bit of my favorite in recent time frequency table to have a, a, a zoom in perspective of it. Okay, so you're grouping by day and within it, you're still grouping by uh, um, day, I mean, dates as of overall, and then you're, you know, multi uh, frequency or multi calculation, multi classification rather, where yeah. you're zooming in by the date, and then within the date, you're zooming in by the base again. And that gives you a little bit of more robust insight again, which is um, the work of EDA. So, like you men rightly mentioned, it's a little bit of back and forth. And that is why a project takes sometimes six months. It's not because we can't just jump to conclusion and say we're done. But those conclusions will make more sense. And even if it's the same conclusion that you end up getting, you're able to explain it in more details because now you understand every single step you took. You understand why some decisions were more um, prominent to be taken than others. And you're able to make some really um, scientifically proven uh, uh, conclusions at the end. Funny enough, we might do all of this and still come up to either mean or mode, or probably we'll just feel because this was based on consistency, probably, you know, just from feeling or back feeling would we'll do a good job or something. Some, I mean, we might just come back to the same assumptions we had before, you know, diving into all of this. But at the end of it all, we have an understanding of why did we do all of these things. Yeah, super, super. Yes. Uh, amazing, um, amazing summary, Mikhail. Okay, I think uh, we want to say something before the Kuzan before I came in. Okay, so it's just, uh, you know, Timitai was really talked about all that in depth. And in fact, from that date distribution, the date distribution, if you remember um, our rules, I think we have about 43,000 or something, if I can remember the number now. So we have about 43,000 something. Um, then we have seven days. All right. Divide 43,000 by seven days. You know, naturally, you should be having 6,000 plus if we are to divide equally by seven days. So typically, 6,000 times seven would give you 42,000. All right. So if you take a critical look, you'll notice that it's not likely Sorry, that we have... Is visualization that I'm not seeing because I can't see anything? Yes, I'm just, you know, I'm just using working knowledge of what I've seen earlier because I wasn't running through... Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... For the purpose of people listening, you know, that's why I had to raise the question. Okay, great. You know, but I'm sure if you have followed from the beginning, right, you remember that we have, I think, for 3,000 and something, so someone can confirm the exact number then if you look at the seven days right if we were to divide equally we should be having six thousand plus but in the data there's nothing that tells us or has proven to us that we have an equal distribution we just have nearly equal distribution so ultimately we might not even be having the exact same number for each of those seven days the one could be, and that's why the one is slightly, uh, I think, slightly higher, or is it slightly lower than day two? You know, it, it tells you that the numbers are not exactly equal. And if you check very well, the other days may not necessarily have equal number of uh, um, occurrences. If we, you know, maybe look, you know, we look at the histogram in more detail, you just maybe plot that specific. Um, histogram, highlight it, expand it, and look at the height of the beans. If we do value counts also, because these are discrete values, I mean, even though they're numbers, they are still discrete values. And so, if we do a kind of value counts, we can get the exact number for each 
value for each day. And that tells us that, okay, so from there we can arrive at the mode, right? But then the mode may not be a strong indicator because, uh, oh, the mode may actually be a strong indicator um, because of the, um, because of the, um, what's it called, the consistency. So even though they are not, they are not likely to be extremely equally distributed, the, the thing is we are having almost consistent values, right? Another thing is that even the mean itself would also work. So if we, if we, if we look at it, you know, we can be having nearly equal values between the mean and the mode. Sometimes these averages, the mean or the mode, they take equal values or nearly equal values. So for these dates, for that, for that day distribution now, you know, you, you, you notice that regardless, if you use mode, it works. If you use mean, it also works. So I can't remember what the other ones look like again, you know, because I wanted us to just reason about the distributions, you know, so that when we are arriving at the conclusion of which one to go for, we know that we have understood it. And just as, as um, Satomita rightly said, um, these things are, uh, uh, they are iterative and, you know, you have to make sure that you can justify every assumption you're making. So, you know, if, if we are working on projects like this, right, externally people might just look at the notebook, see that it's just so brief, but may not know how long it has taken. In a reward project, this data cleaning project alone can take days. You would have to suspend it for a while. Think, you know, you want to refresh your mind, come back to the project, try to have another view of this again, you know, and then just to uh, uh, just to make sure that you are you're not making the right assumptions and you're talking from a place of understanding of the data. So understanding, 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 very important. And that's where EDA comes in. So the Friday session, you know, will be now will, will now will now go further into EDA because this data cleaning matter is not done. You know, we'd have to revisit EDA. You know, still come back to data cleaning, try to find the whole process, ensure the whole thing is qualitative and all that. So let me just hand it over back to Mr. Samuel. Um, so just wrap up this session. All right, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure we all had a great time. Basically, for me, I think uh, very fruitful. You know, when you spend a lot of time around data scientists, you you get the vibe. Eventually, you get the vibe, and it's cool because you know you you end up discovering you have a community that you can fall back to see the best approach. This not be the best approach. You raise the dust, and eventually you you standardize, and and that's that's really cool. So I really appreciate everyone who, who um, contributed, who asked questions, and uh, and provided answers all the same. All right. Um, so what we are going to do now is we are going to close here for tonight. I mean, we could do this all day, and we are still not done. So we're going to stop here for tonight and move. Yeah, move um, move the the remainder sections into the EDA section, uh, EDA and data visualization session, and then from then on we will we'll trash it on and, and hope that we don't get to uh, relocate our, from our houses <laughs> because of the time we spend doing doing this all together. But it's cool, uh, it's great, and and I want to say thank you to everyone who has taken the time to be here and. Um, I, I really hope uh, at NS that you learned amazing things that would make you do extremely well in, in the field of data science. And we keep doing this over and over. And of course, you cannot standardize your knowledge unless you, you make it iterative. That's why I always encourage you to sign up uh, so that your, your journey can actually begin. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. I will close the curtain from here and we'll see you in the next session. Good night. All right, everyone. So um, you can ask the questions while we, um, before we round up. 
um, apart from the technical stuff you've discussed already tonight, if you have questions about our programs, I already shared details about them earlier. But if you have questions about them, um, you can you can ask them, of course. So I will give you answers to that. Um, I have also okay. I've, I've given details about that for the um, session last night. Would uh, um, uh, would send out uh, details about the recap again. We had sent to those who attended um, the last. In fact, we sent to all registered participants, right? So we would send it again along with this particular um, session, so that you can you can go over them again, especially from the beginning, because we went a lot in depth in the last session, Mr. Samuel give a very comprehensive introduction and the um, some of the earlier techniques that have been discussed so we'll go in depth into that um, i mean you can you can get a recap of all that was said then we'll take it further in the eds session then on saturday um we, we've also i think we sent out details about that but more information will still be coming up on saturday we're doing a machine learning series all right and you would have um, you would have the opportunity to be part of a a larger um, faculty, a wider, uh, um, yeah, a larger faculty. So um, four instructors from games would be, um, would be walking you through on that series. So the session starts at 11 a.m., right? So come to the session, make sure that you have your, um, your, um, your laptop for the practicals, your notepad, to write important things because it will be a lot of insights, right? I'll be taking one of the sessions as well, and then we'd have other faculties that you've not even met. Um, Mr. Temitayo too will be handling one of the sessions um, next week, Saturday. So details about those things will be coming up. It's always more interesting when you are within the community, if you are part of the community, because at this time, at this point, you are not going to miss out on any of the information, right? So the moment any webinar is coming up, even while your current classes or the normal schedule of your classes are going on, you can attend any of the sessions at games and not miss out on any details about them. So it's always easier that way. And then you have the, uh, smooth access to the entire faculty at games. So that's pretty much uh, that for tonight. Um, we'll be, um, we'll continue on Friday. So enjoy the rest of your night, everyone. Yes, you can still drop them before we wrap it up. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Have a wonderful night. Rest. Bye.